I've hit the go live button. We're good. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Rittenhouse Astronomical Society monthly event. Uh, my name's Ted Williams, and I have the privilege of being your host tonight and also the president of the society. And um, I'd say that we're probably one of the country's premier founding astronomical societies. It's arguable who's the very first, but we were there amongst the very first. And if you will remember at the last minute, I told you that we had originally started as the Camden Astronomical Society. So I thought I'd just do a quick tidbit here because um, David Rittenhouse was actually convinced by Ben Franklin to move into Philadelphia. David wasn't a big Philadelphia fan. He didn't want to come into Philadelphia. Ben and his friends and others were convinced that for David's livelihood, for him to be in the right circle, for him to be in the area where the grants and the money could come to him, um, he was convinced that he was moving to Center City. There's not a lot written about the friendship that exists between Ben Franklin and David Rittenhouse, but you can glean some of it from the writings. When Ben died, it said that he gave his uh, telescope over to David. And what's interesting is Ben had a few telescopes from what we can tell, a couple of, like an astronomer would. And although astronomy wasn't his main interest, I sometimes wonder if David wasn't one of his go-to people uh, when he wanted to know astronomical uh, issues or discuss issues. We do know that when the telescope was left to David, it was no big thing because the telescope was already at David's place. Um, he had a small observatory at his house downtown in Philadelphia. So I can only speculate or imagine can you imagine when Ben's a little bit tired uh, working with the parliament and what he was doing there, sneaking over to David's house and just sitting down and relaxing and taking a look up at the nighttime sky? Uh, these gentlemen must have done some of this for their enjoyment also. And although David was very astute and a very good record keeper and uh, an amazing polymath at looking at the sky, I I'm sure the two of them shared some joy. So it's with quite an interest that we've developed this uh, relationship with the Franklin Institute. In a way, it's been based on a friendship for a very long time. And tonight we have a person who um, precedes me in the club and I've introduced this gentleman many times. So you'll know my introduction over the years because I've said to many people, it was Derek who got me into the astronomical field when I went on a field trip with a class and got envious of what he was doing on the rooftop with his observatory at the Franklin. And uh, I therefore went into the planetarium field also. And so he's been a big influence on me as many others. But tonight I wanna to pass it over to Denise because Denise has worked directly with Dave uh, or with um, with uh, Derek. I work I'm with Dave too. <laughs> well, I'm reading names and Dave is right under Derek. So I got to get this right myself. But um, <laughs> she's worked with Derek quite a long time too. And I wanted to get her in on this because she was one of kind of spearheaded this and, and got this to happen. So Denise, would you do a little intro for Derek for us, please? Why, sure. Well, hello, everybody. And Derek, thanks for coming. I'm very uh, happy to welcome you. Uh, yeah, our April meeting wouldn't be the same without you. And we had a lot of club members say, when are we going to hear from Derek again? We miss him. And you know what? I miss you too, Derek. I mean, I met you way back in the 90s, the late 90s. Do you believe it was that long ago? Derek and I wrote planetarium shows together, starred in those planetarium shows together, hung out at conferences together. And I feel like I not only got to know him kind of as a mentor, but as a friend as well. And I have to say, you you stuck in my corner when I got laid off at the Franklin Institute, and I will never forget that, buddy. You're always there for me. But anyway, Derek, you inspired me to present astronomy to people in a fun way, to make it engaging uh, for little kids and adults alike, to make it fun. That's what I got from you. You always made it fun. You always made it relative to the common person. You don't have to be some rocket scientist or an egghead to understand and love this stuff. Um, I love seeing you on TV. I always get a special thrill and uh, I'm really happy that you're going to be with us tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce the chief astronomer of the Franklin Institute and our NASA ambassador and friend of all of us here in the Rittenhouse Astronomical Society, Mr. Derek Pitts. Yay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. That was a really wonderful introduction. I really like that uh, because it talks about us as being friends as well as colleagues. And I really do appreciate that. 
and all that stuff that you talk about learning from me, I stole all that stuff from you guys. <laughs> you know, and that's the way things work in this business, right? We borrow stuff from each other all the time. So, and uh, Ted, I'll just take a little stipend for every year you've been in astronomy since you say I got you started in this. You can just send me a, you know, just a little check and that'll be fine. <laughs> the pension's good, but I'm not sure that good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you're, you're right, Denise. I really do feel as, uh, that it's important that uh, as we sort of connect with people about astronomy, I think it's really important for people to recognize that um, no matter how difficult or complex a topic is in astronomy, there's something in it that everybody can understand, or there's some aspect about astronomy that somebody can get deeply into no matter what their level of expertise is. And breaking down that wall of, you know, I always say it, uh, breaking down that wall that disconnects people by saying, oh, this is too difficult for you, I think is really the wrong way to go about this, this kind of work, um, because we want to get people into it to enjoy it. And that's, and that's what I do is I just really enjoy sharing whatever information I have to share with everybody. So um, I learn everything that I'm doing in this from everybody else around the industry and, and happy to say that without any problem at all. I'm also really happy to have been part of Rittenhouse for such a long time because I've known everybody for such a long time. So uh, we're all friends here, but I thank you again for that really wonderful introduction. I think that's the nicest introduction I've ever had. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we had a lot You're of fun. You're worth it, Derek. You're worth it. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of fun. We had a, and we continue to have a lot of fun. So that's really cool. Okay. All right. So thank you so much for having me. I really do appreciate it. Um, you know, these days, uh, work at the Franklin Institute is, you know, sketchy at best, because uh, some of us aren't there as much as we typically were used to being there. I'm not in the building as often as I used to be right now. Uh, but we'll be getting back to that sometime soon, I hope. Uh, I'm looking forward to being back in the building. And, uh, you know, Franklin right now is only open Wednesday through Sunday. And uh, as Mike has probably told you, we're on a reduced schedule and all that other sort of stuff. And, you know, we've taken quite a hit since uh, COVID-19, but hopefully we'll be getting back into the swing of things uh, as things improve around society with the vaccinations and all that other sort of stuff. So hopefully we'll be able to get back to doing our regular kind of astronomy stuff. I really do miss that. Uh, so tonight, what I wanted to do is uh, talk about a topic that I think is uh, can be very exciting for 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 people. Um, I got started with my interest in in astronomy and space exploration when I was very young, when I was probably five or six, and I knew I was interested in this kind of stuff. But it was right at the beginning of the space race, the early 1960s space race. And that gave me something that I could really focus on. I could grab hold on, grab hold of and focus on because there was a regular event. Uh, there was a regular event on, a, on kind of like a schedule. And all this was the beginning of the program to build up uh, America's uh, skill base in space exploration so that we could attempt a landing on the moon. And so from the early 1960s uh, on, there was a regular thing for me to become attached to. And uh, you know, my interest in that has remained, of course, uh, as many of you know, from a lot of the different kinds of work that I've been doing. Uh, but there was a lull for a while, as many people know, between the space shuttle program and the next generation of space exploration to come about. And I think as the shuttle program went on, there was a, a, a disconnect for a lot of people for what was happening in the future. It seemed as if perhaps the space shuttle was the be all and end all. And when that particular program closed down, many people thought that that was the end of space exploration for the United States. And I like to help people understand that that was a transition rather than being the end of the program. And I also like to point out for people that there's a tremendous amount for folks to be interested in these days because of what I believe is happening in what I call uh, the next space race. So my presentation tonight is about that next space race through the lens of an earlier generation, the current generation and the next generation. So uh, I'm gonna get started with that. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, if you have questions, folks, uh, I'm gonna try and whip through my program pretty quickly. Uh, so that we'll have plenty of time for questions. 
Uh, and please think of some questions that you want to ask, and I'll be happy to answer anything I can ask. Uh, and if I don't know an answer, of course, I'll say, hey, I have no idea. Somebody else out there might know, and we can go that way too, okay? So uh, let me share my screen here. Here we are. Okay, and I'm going to see if I can get this into presentation mode and then get my ugly mug out of the way here. Um, if you notice the background behind me, it's the AAS, uh, American Astronomical Society. I got this background uh, because I did a presentation for them this past Saturday at their first uh, solar eclipse workshop for the 2024 solar eclipse. Uh, I don't know if anybody here attended that, but uh, they held this first workshop pulling together some people to talk about different aspects of programming for that. And I was lucky enough to be part of that. So that's where my AAS background comes from. And we can talk a little bit about that too, if you want to. Okay, so the new race for space. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about it because I find it so exciting and so interesting uh, what's happening in so many different ways. So let me get rolling with this. Uh, just a moment, there we go. Okay. So the first generation of space flight, you know, if you look at today's space explorations that are going on, systems that are used to get us to low Earth orbit, uh, you know, you can look at it and you can say, this is not your father's space program anymore. It's not your grandfather's space program anymore. In the first generation of space flight, there were these launch vehicles, these iconic launch vehicles that so many people know so well. You can see my imagery across the screen. There's the Russian Soyuz uh, launch vehicle, the American Delta IV, the Ariana Spas launch vehicle, the uh, Chinese National Space, A Space Agency's Long March uh, launch vehicle, the uh, Japanese Space Agency H2N launch vehicle, and of course the iconic Saturn V launch vehicle that was used to lift astronauts and everything they needed up to the moon. Uh, for us to uh, put those first footprints on the moon. That was the first generation. And that first generation, as iconic as it was, uh, in some ways, as you look back on it, was actually quite primitive. Uh, and we can all be surprised at how well it worked. Uh, there were some incidents when there were some you know, accidents that happened, uh, some explosions here and there, uh, but on the whole, uh, the way it worked out as successfully as it did, given, as I say, as we look back on it now, uh, at how primitive we, it was, it's surprising that we were able to get so far. I mean, if you take a look at the cockpit of the, uh, of the Apollo uh, capsule now that took astronauts to the moon, how many of us would be willing to uh, take a trip in a spacecraft that seemed to be so antiquated in its control systems? I mean, there are hardly any screens at all and uh, everything is almost everything is analog almost everything was analog how many of us would be willing to travel in a spacecraft that had less computer capability than the phone we carry in our pocket now we all know that story so back then you really had to have the right stuff and uh, part of that right stuff was you had to be nervy enough to take the chance in in flying on on those on those rockets that were getting us into space for the first time the second generation of space exploration right now is embodied by uh, things like space station. Uh, the US space station, uh, I should say international space station, Chinese space station are highly you know, iconic of this second generation where it's not just getting into space, but it's actually doing things in space. So we have, uh, in addition to this in the second generation, we have expanding non-governmental organizations there's corporate development, and there's also expanding international development. And two of the major icons of the second generation of access to space and this new generation of space exploration are the Blue Origin launch systems and the SpaceX launch systems. The image that you see here of Blue Origin is the New Shepard launch vehicle uh, uh, with the capsule on top. And also on the right, we see the SpaceX Falcon 9. And in this case, it looks like it's launching a payload. You can tell that by the fairing that's at the top that's enclosing uh, whatever payload you see there. The other cool thing about this image I'll point out on the right of the SpaceX launch vehicle is if you see the towers with the white masts on top, there's a direct connection to Benjamin Franklin because those white uh, 
masts that you see on those towers, those are actually lightning rods uh, invented by Benjamin Franklin. So they're connected directly to space exploration, particularly on the launch side of things. So that's uh, second generation. So let's talk a little bit more about second generation. International Space Station has been dominating near Earth orbit since 2000. So for 20 years, uh, this craft has been growing and expanding and giving us access to uh, experience in low Earth orbit so we can build our chops for living and working in space. And it's been doing a great job. Uh, there has been some talk about uh, decommissioning space station by 2025. I say that the $100 billion that's invested in this is uh, enough that either NASA will figure out how to keep it going with a greater international partnership uh, or somebody else will take it over. This is too great an asset to deorbit, no matter how you look at it in terms of how long it's been in orbit. Uh, the systems are not deteriorating to any significant degree. So, uh, and since everything is so easily interchangeable, you know, the basic structure can be continued to use over and over and over again, if, even if you just want to change out components. So I don't see the structure going any place anytime soon. It'll continue to be used. It may even it, it could even grow, grow larger. So we'll see what's up with that. But International Space Station is, the, is, is one of the iconic pieces of that second generation. SpaceX, the SpaceX launch system, of course, really embodies what this second generation is about because the major con concept that comes across in second generation that marks it as such a incredible separation uh, and so really game-changing technology from the first generation is reusability. Nobody thought about reusability back in the first generation. Everybody used it once and threw it away for the most part. In this case, in second generation, it's all about reusability. And the reason why it's about reusability is because it drives down the cost of space, access to space. I'm sure a lot of you have heard some about SpaceX. Uh, here are the launch platforms that they're currently using. There's the Falcon 9, which is their workhorse, the Falcon Heavy, which is their bigger workhorse uh, that they don't use all that often, and the Dragon series of either cargo capsules or crew capsules. The cargo capsules have been in use for several years now, and the crew capsules are just starting to be in use. And their next endeavor, which is Starship. And Starship has three main objectives that it's going to be used for. And that is the really big target item for SpaceX to get uh, operating. And we've heard some about Starship. I'll talk about that a little in a little bit more detail. But it's the reusability that really marks this difference. Uh, when, I, when I first used this particular instance, uh, I, have, I was de describing Falcon 9 and the Falcon Heavy rockets as having landed, uh, the boosters having come back from launching a payload and landing successfully, you know, 15 times. Now it's dozens of times that they've had successful landings of the boosters that have been used to put payloads in orbit. And if you think about it, let's just say that it costs, you know, $100 million to launch a payload because of the, you know, Let's say that 50 million is the cost of the booster and 50 million is the payload. Well, you know, every time you launch this booster, the use cost goes down dramatically. You can keep cutting it in half approximately so that by the time you've used it, you know, eight or 10 times, it's costing you nothing. That booster costs you nothing because you've amortized the cost over that number of launches. So all you're doing it is, you know, the cost of cleaning it up and refueling it so you can use it again. So this really is a major change and a major dis difference. Now, I hope the audio comes through on this, but that the audio isn't really important. This is one of the first landings, and I really love this one because of the fact that it's a tandem landing. So on the bottom screen, you can see cameras from the two boosters as they come down to the target landings. The top right is the core booster, and now in the top left, you can see the two boosters coming down to land simultaneously together at the same time from a Falcon Heavy uh, launch. If nothing takes your breath away about this change between the first generation and second generation, it is this. This is autonomous control using GPS to bring these launch vehicles back down to a spot on target landing. Absolutely incredible and amazing. 
And those were the two outer boosters. This is the center booster for the uh, Falcon Heavy coming back to land on the drone ship out in the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, all of these landings put together have enabled SpaceX to open doors for space exploration in ways that haven't been possible before. Uh, let me see if I can just move on from here. Yeah. So all of this has been under the direction of this guy, Elon Musk. Uh, we all, I think we all probably know some about Elon Musk, either from the SpaceX work that he's been uh, pushing forward uh, or the Tesla automobile work that he's been pushing forward, and maybe some of the other technologies. You know, this work in SpaceX was born out of his dream as a kid to want to go to space or to make space accessible. And uh, it's been his seed money that has allowed him to circumvent a lot of the bureaucratic red tape that holds up the American space program, that holds up the National uh, Space Agency, and not only the American National Space Agency, but space agencies, national space agencies around the world. Uh, he's been able to cut through, if you will, the technological red tape and the bureaucratic red tape that binds these and holds these other agencies from uh, doing this very, very innovative work that he's been gathering engineers to press forward on these new designs for, uh, for about a decade and a half. And so these innovations have really been opening doors to allow us to dream about the possibilities of what comes next. So part of that in SpaceX, outside of the reusability of Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, is this new endeavor called Starship. Uh, Starship was first imagined a couple of years ago when instead of being called Starship, it was known as the BFR, uh, the, uh, the BFR, the big freaking rocket. And you can replace the word freaking with whatever you want. And uh, if you're thinking of something that's not mentionable in a family audience, yeah, that's what it actually originally was. And the, 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 the SpaceX, the uh, Starship uh, is meant actually to replace all of what's currently being used by SpaceX. And the reason why is because SpaceX wants to have a launch vehicle that can carry hundreds of times the mass that a typical launch vehicle can carry. So if you look at the schematic here, you can see how it's laid out. There's the crew cabin, the cargo cabin, and then the booster and that sort of stuff. But that really doesn't give you an idea of how big it is. Here's a comparison for you of how big it is. And don't worry about the numbers on the left-hand side, just look at it in comparison to the Saturn V launch vehicle that carried astronauts to the moon. If you look at the very tippy top of the Saturn V, you can see that there's the escape tower, that long narrow spike that's right at the top that comes down to a little lattice work that connects it to the capsule that is the Apollo capsule. And the Apollo capsule is just that little tiny upper piece the service module is right behind it, and that's it. That's it for cargo, and that's it for astronauts. But in the Starship, it's meant to be able to carry up to 100 people at once, or an equal amount of, of mass uh, up to low Earth orbit at the very least. If you look at the very bottom of the Starship, you'll see just to the left, there's a little white speck. Well, that would be the size of a standard human standing next to it. So you can see it really is large. And the intent of this is to be able to have launch capability in payload to be able to carry all the supplies that might be needed to establish a lunar base. That's going to be a lot. And so if you think about stepping forward in this, using this as a carrot, if you will, to pull the technology along to start building in this direction to get something of this size and capability, imagine all the great technological development that comes on between where we are right now and getting to this. So even if we don't get to something like this, what comes out of it in the meantime is certainly increased capability beyond what we know already. But that's not all he wants to use it for. It would also be outfitted for International Space Station resupply capability. So, you know, you can store a tremendous amount of material in something that size connected to International Space Station. And of course, the other idea is to use it as a supersonic transport around Earth. And in this case, the thought is, instead of, you know, doing transatlantic 
transcontinental air flight that takes you, you know, 18 hours for the longest flights from New York out to Australia, why not just do it in under 45 minutes by using Starship as the way to take you up to low Earth orbit and drop you back down on the Earth within 45 minutes? And the idea is that with uh, Starship as an Earth supersonic transport, you would have access to any place on the Earth within 45 minutes. Now, this sounds crazy in some ways, but if you really think about it, there's no reason why that can't happen. There's no reason why that can't be done. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. Some of the technologies haven't been developed yet. And yes, there are cost issues and things like that. But let's just think about what Musk has done so far with SpaceX. The process that he has used to develop the SpaceX launch system is an iterative process. You design something, you build it, you test it. If the test fails, you figure out why it fails, fix that, go back and test it again. And he's done this, as you all know already, over and over and over again, to beat out any bugs that are in the system such that the Falcon 9 is incredibly successful as a launch vehicle right now. And he's doing that same work with Starship. If you've been paying attention over the last month, there have been four Starship test flights that have ended in failure, most of them spectacularly, as they call it, uh, rapid unscheduled disassembly, I think or is, the, is the term that they use for when it crash lands. But in doing this, every time they've done this, they've learned something else that they apply to the next test flight that they get right. So they'll continue doing this iterative process over and over and over, teaching people that test flight is exactly for that. It's for building and testing to make sure you get it right. Uh, they don't seem to have a problem with doing that at all. Uh, there should be another flight coming up soon. But the ultimate goal of this is to be able to provide a payload uh, and a launch, a launch vehicle and payload to be able to establish a base on Mars. That's what Musk's ultimate goal is in the space flight business, is to get out to Mars. He would like to get his family out to Mars uh, before he leaves the planet. And he imagines that within the next century, there could be a buildup of a colony on Mars that looks like this. Now, this is major dreaming. This is major, major dreaming. If you look at this image in detail, you can see that over on the left, there are five landing pads for, uh, for the Starship uh, uh, rocket model. And uh, they all come down to several others that are part of this uh, community that you see here. But he's envisioning this as a possibility. And why not put something out there? Who knows how far it'll get along. So I think that's a that's a really major one. As I said, the current Starship prototype, I should have said uh, the current Starship prototype, uh, Starship number 11, did a 15 kilometer test flight last week. The flight went great until it was time for it to reorient itself as it was returning to land. And for uh, one reason or another, uh, there was a rapid unscheduled disassembly of the spacecraft that was headed back down to land. Uh, it blew up in spectacular fashion. And uh, as you watch the video through uh, Space Flight Now, I'll talk about that in a minute, you could see uh, parts and pieces flying all over the place as a result of that. Uh, Starship number 15 is coming up next. It's been rolled out to the pad so that it can be uh, set up for launch. And I would imagine in the next two weeks, we might see a flight of that. I'll tell you where you can find out that information. But second generation also includes this, the Virgin Galactic system that's uh, being put together by this guy whose name is going to come to me, Sir Richard Branson. He's been working on this for a long time now. But the idea of this is going in a slightly different direction. This direction is going for space tourism, providing an opportunity for us to be able to travel to space easily for a reasonable price. Now, right now, the tickets for this are outrageous, $250,000 a pop. But as this system gets going and the flights begin over the next decade, that price is gonna come down dramatically. Branson has been pushing for uh, test flights over the last several years. There have been a couple of setbacks in the program, but they had a very successful test flight last year. They're looking for another one late this year, and they really hope to get this program started where they're actually taking civilians up to the edge of space for about a 10, 15 minute you know, trip up to the edge of space. He's really hoping to get that done next year. We'll see how that works out. They still have more test flights they have to do.
But if you look at the design of this, it's very futuristic. And the idea is to pull us forward into the future and make this kind of thing a regular aspect of our everyday lives, a regular opportunity for people to fly in space. And of course, he wants to do this both on the tourism side and provide some you know, some space testing opportunities in this environment as well. But this doesn't look anything like what, you know, the spacecraft of our fathers and grandfathers uh, launch systems look like. This looks sleek and cool and inviting and it makes it look like everybody would want to do this. And it also makes it look very much like standard commercial air flight today, which we are all comfortable with. So he wants to get across this feeling that traveling to space will become easy and comfortable as well. So uh, we can look forward to seeing that. You and five friends could travel on a spacecraft like that. Uh, like I say, for only $250,000 right now, you can do it. Uh, it's based at Las Cruces, New Mexico, near a place called Burnt Flats, uh, which I often say is uh, what the name of the place should be if uh, a spacecraft comes down and crash lands, uh, the spot would be burnt flat. Anyway, uh, the spaceport that is out there at Las Cruces, New Mexico is going to be the base station for the Virgin flights, and uh, that place is up and operating, and so hopefully next year we'll start to see the flights happening out of that. Let's talk about Blue Origin for just a moment. Uh, New Shepard 15 had a test flight today, earlier today. I watched it live for 10 minutes at about one o'clock, at about 10 minutes of one, the flight was, and it was successful. Blasted up to about 236,000 feet in about five minutes and came back down to a successful upright landing uh, the launch vehicle came down and landed just beautifully, and the capsule separated from the launch vehicle and also landed. It is said that in the new, in the Blue Origin New Shepard capsule, the G's going up to space is only about three, and astronauts on board this would experience G's a little bit higher than that coming back on reentry. But this system seems to be working well too, as you know. The guy behind this is also the guy that has been running Amazon for the last, uh, for, the, for its entire life, Jeff Bezos. And here's the interior of the uh, New Shepard. This doesn't look anything like the Apollo capsule did either. Can you imagine the Apollo astronauts getting an opportunity to ride in something like this? Spacious, big windows, comfortable chairs. I can't see it here, but I'm imagining in the background behind us, there's some sort of really sleek bathroom with a shower and a toilet and all those other cool conveniences. That's probably not how it is, but that's the way it looks anyway. It makes it look much more inviting and much more comfortable. And you can easily envision yourself as being part of that, uh, sitting in that capsule, heading up to space. Here's a graphic that just shows you across the history of spaceflight what some of the launch vehicles have looked like and the comparisons of what's coming up online right now. So you can see the Falcon 9 and the Falcon Heavy right in the middle of the pack here next to the Delta IV Heavy. You can see the new Glenn booster that is included here. That's part of Blue Origin. That's the next series of boosters that they're thinking of building. And you can see how big they are in comparison to the Saturn V. And if you recall from the previous graphic that we saw, you can imagine where the Starship would fit in this in terms of size. So. It's, it's a lot. And if you think uh, Blue Origin hasn't been around and hasn't been doing anything, they already have contracts with the US Air Force to provide launch capability uh, for taking payloads up into low Earth orbit. And they are really moving along. Uh, and it's those contracts that make the difference. But here's really where Bezos wants to go uh, with Blue Origin, uh, with, uh, yes, uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the New Horizons, New, New Shepard and the Blue Origin, he wants to create a landing vehicle for the moon. So you may be aware that NASA's next big project is the Artemis program, getting us back to the moon. That looks like it's gonna be a great and exciting program. There's just one flaw right now, and that is we don't have a landing vehicle yet for the moon. The contracts are out for design and Blue Origin is in that race 
to win the contract to build a lander for the moon. And that's what you're seeing in the background behind Bezos here is a prototype for something that could land astronauts and equipment onto the surface of the moon. As you've already learned about from a previous meeting, uh, Bigelow Aerospace Inflatables is also in this mix to provide equipment uh, for habitats, both in orbit and also on the surface of the moon as well. I'll show you an image of that coming up soon. But just to touch on that again for a second, all of those, all of those possibilities are advancing our steps out into space faster than we could have done with just the National Space Agency. It's not to say that NASA isn't doing anything. NASA is doing a tremendous amount, but these commercial entities are really pushing things along. But there are other players out there. Of course, you know about Rose Cosmos that has been providing launch capability for Soyuz to take us up to International Space Station since the space shuttle program uh, 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 was, was finished. And uh, Roscosmos will continue to be one of those major players in space exploration going forward, because one thing we've come to understand is it's way too risky and it costs way too much money. And because of that, we need partners and we need partners who uh, we can work with. And we've been working with the Russians for decades now, so it makes sense that we continue with them. Same is true for the Japanese space agency that has provided the Kibo module for International Space Station, along with a number of other technologies. They've been partners with us uh, since International Space Station got started 20, 21 years ago. But China has been out there doing things as well. Here's the Shenzhou 8 spacecraft docking with Tiangong-1, uh, the Chinese space station uh, that has been in orbit. And you know that the goal for China is to launch their second space station, much larger, and uh, will give them capability to, to stay on orbit, uh, to have astronauts on orbit for extended periods of time. Will we eventually partner with China? I don't think so. China's, in, uh, China's goal is to reestablish itself uh, or to have itself seen as being a major space player. And so they're gonna continue to do that work themselves so that they can take a place on the space stage much like uh, Russia has done and the United States has done. They've done a tremendous amount. As you know, the Chang'e lander uh, on the moon Got, uh, had the U-2 rover roll across the dark side of the moon, take a bunch of images uh, and send those images back. And it has been working successfully for just under a year now, I think on the surface on the dark side of the moon, if you will. So they've been really, really successful. On to the third generation though, here it is. The third generation is the Artemis program of NASA to explore the moon and Mars and using the moon as a gateway to Mars. What NASA really wants to do is it wants to pull all of its assets together that it has been building up. The commercial program, International Space Station, its next generation of launch vehicles, and its, uh, its, its, you know, its, its, its skills and abilities that it has developed for doing robotic exploration of Mars to open the door for us to get back to the moon and use the moon as a training base for human exploration of Mars. So the Artemis program is that program that's gonna allow that to happen. It's gonna build up all of the infrastructure that's necessary for that and give us that opportunity to build up the skills that we need to go on to Mars. Uh, you can follow the Artemis program quite easily at NASA because it's beginning to emerge uh, quite forcefully. And of course, if you go to the NASA website, you'll be able to find out all sorts of information about that program. It is dependent though on the space launch system NASA's next super booster to uh, take heavy payloads up to the moon and beyond. Uh, this program has been uh, uh, in design and testing for the last several years. There was just a major booster engine test about a month ago, a little less than a month ago now, which was the last test before the all up assembly of the booster system for an actual test flight not later this year, but early next year. But you know, some are beginning to question whether or not this is a productive avenue for NASA to run down, building up the space launch system. And the reason why is because SLS is sort of like looking backward in the sense that only the solid rocket boosters that you see on the left and right of the orange tank are reusable. The rest of it is all expendable. The rest of it is all throwaway. But if you think about how SpaceX has the Falcon Super, the Falcon Heavy booster, 
and is building up the capability of the Starship booster, some are beginning to think it makes more sense for NASA to make use of the launch systems that SpaceX is building up rather than throw a bunch of money at the SLS system. Perhaps they're thinking that uh, redundancy is a good idea to have uh, so that there are uh, other launch systems available. But if you look at it, it has the capability to take 95 metric tons to low Earth orbit, uh, 27 metric tons up to translunar injection orbit. And so far, $18 billion has been spent on this. Uh, and the cost for this is $2.5 billion per launch. That's a lot of money for not very much payload because as you look at this, the payload section is just the white section that you see at the top of this. So if you think about the Starship version of doing this, maybe it makes more sense for NASA to do that. And you can see here, here's a really easy comparison between these systems of Falcon Heavy on the far left and Starship on the far right. If you just look at, for example, the orange bar next to the rocket, you can see that Starship has the capability to take, to take 72 metric tons as opposed to, I'm sorry, uh, let me just do that, 156 metric tons in the yellow bar as opposed to 95 metric tons uh, for the SLS system. So that makes you think that maybe NASA ought to be rethinking what its plan is for the launch system that it plans to use. And of course, Starship is reusable as opposed to SLS being just a throwaway. Nonetheless, NASA does have an Orion crew capsule and upper stage rocket motor uh, uh, being put together right now. Uh, those two pieces uh, have been designed and are being built and they are meant to fly on the CST-100 Starliner. This is an Atlas uh, V launch vehicle uh, built by United Launch Alliance that will provide additional launch capability. So that's been in design and in, and in development uh, and has been tested already, uh, but it still needs more testing before anything happens. The Boeing Starliner spacecraft uh, also it has been under design and is ready for testing. It had one test flight already. It needs to do another test flight before it's actually uh, uh, sanctioned for human human rated flight. It's got a little bit uh, a little ways to go. Uh, one of the chief designers on this is a friend of Rittenhouse Astronomical Society, uh, Captain Chris Ferguson, who was a uh, space shuttle commander. I should say Commander Chris Ferguson, uh, who was a space shuttle commander of the very last space shuttle mission. Uh, so uh, he's been working on this. Um, Crew Dragon, though, is again. Uh, I should say that. That, that spacecraft is reusable, as is the Crew Dragon. Crew Dragon, though, has already been used to deliver astronauts to International Space Station, uh, and its capability is growing. Uh, it's finished all of its test flights and been space proven. Take a look at the interior of this. Oh my gosh, who wouldn't want to fly on this? Take a look at these really beautiful uh, futuristic spacesuits. Uh, any, anybody would want to get into one of those uh, and take a quick trip up, up to International Space Station in something that has so much room uh, and is so comfortable. Uh, also, uh, this, is, this has all of the latest electronics design on board that allow it to dock autonomously with International Space Station, just like the Boeing Starliner uh, does. Uh, but it's, it's the latest in, the, in modern technologies uh, to get people to space. Of course, you know, we have to yet build the gateway spacecraft that's going to be like the Lunar International Space Station, if you will. This is going to be the location where astronauts get to before they head down to the moon. They'll spend maybe uh, a week or so here uh, before they actually take a landing craft down to the surface of the moon. And it's that landing craft that really is needed to be designed and built because although we might NASA might be able to build up everything else, the space launch system, get the gateway started and all those things, we need a landing system for that. And right now, these three companies are in the running to build something. Dianetics on the left, SpaceX in the middle, and uh, this national team of Blue Origin, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Grumman and Draper are currently uh, vying for the contract to build something to actually get people down to the surface. Now, here's the thing about this. The idea was that we would put people on the surface of the moon in 2024, 2024. This is 2021. So how much time do we have? 
two and a half years to make this all happen? I think not. I think that's not going to happen by 2024. I think 2028 is a much more reasonable date, and there has been some whisper about that as being the date by which we would get actual boots back on the ground at the moon. Because remember, these spacecraft still have to be designed, built, and tested, along with Gateway that has not yet been built and tested. So all of these things have to be built and tested before we can actually get down to the surface of the moon. And they all have to have capability to get down to the surface of the moon with the astronauts, with equipment, and then get back up again. Go back to Gateway so that astronauts can get back to, to Earth. But going forward into the future of the moon, we can see inflatable habitat, habitats like this uh, might actually be the easiest way to get some kind of infrastructure built up on the surface of the moon, as well as using lava tubes as a way to uh, build, uh, insert inflatable uh, structures to build up uh, possibilities for being out onto the surface of the moon. And all of these technologies hopefully ultimately will get us uh, on the way to thinking about heading out to Mars. But if we're thinking that that's gonna happen anytime soon, and I'm gonna skip forward a little bit more quickly here, one of the things that we're gonna to need to do is we're gonna need a faster boat. This is sort of modeled after the, uh, the line from Jaws of we're gonna need a bigger boat. We're gonna need a faster boat because the length of time it takes us to get there right now is really way too long. Uh, humans have not had that kind of uh, space experience for these long trips out to Mars where it's gonna take us, you know, a, a full trip out to Mars is now looking like, you know, three years or three and a half years at the least. So we need a lot, a lot more speed to get us there a lot faster. We seem to be getting pretty good at landing things onto the surface of Mars. There's a couple of ways that that could be done. We saw just recently with the landing of Perseverance spacecraft uh, rover that we have proven that that method works really well. But is that something that we really wanna try with humans? Maybe we wanna try something that's a little less um, violent, if you will, for getting down to the surface of Mars. And hopefully what we can do is we can make use of the uh, ideas that Bob Zubrin put forth back in 1960, 1976 in his book, The Case for Mars, where the plan was to send everything that would be needed for humans to uh, sort of camp out for several months on Mars, send all that stuff ahead of astronauts getting there with the intent that it can autonomously set itself up, habitats, oxygen production, water production, fuel production, all those things get there on Mars, set themselves up and be ready for astronauts when they come so that they can immediately move into the habitats and have a safe environment to be in. Uh, hopefully that can be employed so that once we get there, uh, we'll be able to uh, be there safely. But this dream, 100 years from now to have a settlement on Mars, I'm thinking that these technologies will be the technologies that pull us along to getting further along in the human exploration of space, uh, human exploration of space. Uh, last but not least, you've probably heard some about uh, Project Breakthrough Starshot in which uh, Yuri Milner has put together $100 million to develop a tiny spacecraft to be sent out to Proxima Centauri. This is just a reconnaissance spacecraft system. No humans would travel on this, but the idea is that these little tiny spacecraft about the size of a postage stamp would ride a laser beam uh, out to uh, Alpha Centauri, Proxima Centauri, and cut the travel time short enough that they could actually get there in 20 years. And the information that could be sent back would tell us whether or not that uh, there's any chance of habitable planets orbiting Proxima Centauri uh, by just using these tiny little postage stamp size microchip uh, information gathering and producing uh, uh, devices that are attached to solar sails that would be driven by laser beam from Earth. $100 million is a good start but there's a whole lot of technology that still has to be put together to make that happen. Well, all of this folks is going in the direction of expanding the human presence in space. This is all really, really ambitious, but when we look at the iterative process that SpaceX has been using, and we look at the goals of NASA of getting people out to Mars and on to exploring the rest of the solar system, 
we can see how these two together really do have the potential to make this really happen over the next 30 to 40 years. I don't think we're gonna to get to Mars before the late 30s actually, because there's so much work that has to be done, just building up our skills and infrastructure for the moon, let alone uh, for getting to Mars. But it still shows us that there's great possibility going forward in the next century for expanded exploration of the solar system by humans. So if you stay tuned, um, you'll be able to uh, keep up with everything that's happening because the modern technologies, video technologies, allow us to travel along with the astronauts as all this is happening so that we can be right there with them as this exploration of the solar system is happening. So uh, stay tuned to NASA. You can stay tuned to SpaceX as well and these other commercial entities that are blazing these new paths. And in that way, you'll be able to ride right along with them as we head out into the solar system. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And if we still have time for questions. Yes, we do. Thank you very much, Derek. That was great. Um, if you want to look at the chat room too, uh, we, there were some notes taken and everything that went through there. Um, let's join everybody here again on this one. And let me think if I change my view here, it might change all your view. Give me a second. Okay. I am muted fastest, so I'm going to ask my question first. Okay, go ahead, Denise. Derek, if you're a betting man, which one do you think is going to be the winner? Which is going to get us out there first? So I think SpaceX. I'm betting on SpaceX for that. And I'm betting on SpaceX because uh, they... Uh, so first of all, they are a driven, they are a driven company that uh, believes very strongly in this process of design build, test over and over and over again. And they have the fan financial backing to make that happen. But more importantly, they don't have the government red tape. They don't have the government bureaucracy that might hold them up. The problem with the national space agencies is that the governing bodies of any of these countries has to approve what the budgets are. So, you know, NASA, for example, is a really, is a really good example of that. Uh, NASA has ideas of what it wants to do, but Congress has to approve what happens and Congress has to approve the budget. So no matter what the president says is he wants to see how he or she wants to see happen, the problem is that Congress has to agree on it. And not everybody in Congress agrees that, uh, you know, a growing space program is something they want to do. It's all politically tangled and that causes huge problems. So, uh, you know, it's, it, I often say that it's, it's not NASA that doesn't want to do these things. It con it's Congress that, that doesn't pull together the will and say that this is what we're going to do. So I think SpaceX is going to be the leader in this. I think Blue Origin is coming on strong. And I think that, um, that, that uh, Virgin Galactic is definitely going to open the doors for space tourism for the common person to be able to travel to space. There are a few other players in that space tourism market, but uh, these are the big ones right now that I think are going to do it. Before another question, thank you, Derek. Uh, I just want to say to our worldwide audience, we're going to say goodbye to you right now. For our members, please hold in there. Uh, this is an advantage of being in a membership for Rittenhouse Astronomical Society. Uh, the, con the conversation gets to continue on. But thank you very much, Dr. Derek Pitts, for addressing a little bit of the future of frontiers in space. Signing off to the worldwide audience right now and uh, welcoming 